Morning, everyone, and welcome. Sorry about that. I'm so excited to be here with you this morning in the beautiful A. Felix DuPont Chapel. I feel your presence, and I look forward to worshiping with you this morning. We have a beautiful service prepared, and I hope you were all able to find the bulletin which Ms. Jacob so lovingly prepared and put out for us this morning. We start with a prelude, Jesus Christ is risen today. Continue with the opening sentences on the front of your bulletin. Alleluia, Christ is risen today. We now sing our opening hymn, Jesus is risen, let us sing.
I am with you? Let us pray. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open. All of our desires known and from you, no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Peter, standing with eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. You that are Israelites, listen to what I have to say. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with deeds of power, wonders, and signs that God did through him among you. As you yourself know, this man handed over to you according to the definite plan and for knowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of those outside the law. But God raised him up, having freed him from the death, because it was impossible for him to be held in its power. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand so that I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. Moreover, my flesh will live in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One experience corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Fellow Israelites, I may say to you confidently of our ancestor David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Since he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would put one of his descendants on his throne. Foreseeing this, David spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, saying, He was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh experience corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that all of us are witnesses. The word of the Lord. We will now do Psalm 118. Please join in singing the refrain.
Schedule him will now be led by the Corain O'Connell family. Please join them in Christ Has Arisen. Rejoice when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe a week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them this time. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord. And my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen, yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please pray with me. Lord, take my lips and speak through them. Take our minds and think through them. Take our hands and do your good work through them. And on this beautiful second Sunday of Easter morning, please take our hearts and set them on fire with hope and strength and courage and love and peace. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. 
In a New York Times article on Wednesday by Taylor Lorenz, which was entitled, The News is Making People Anxious, You'll Never Believe What We're Reading Instead, Lorenz said that we are experiencing a growth market for good news. In fact, Brendan Harvey, the founder of Good, 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 said that in seeking out these stories of good things, readers aren't necessarily looking for an escape from the news, more than just wanting to be distracted from COVID. They want a genuine sense of hopefulness in the response to COVID, he said. Have you noticed it too? The positivity on TV, ads about hospitals and healthcare workers that make you actually tear up and fill your heart with a sense of good. No nasty political attack ads, even though we're in an election year. Everyone being good to each other. Or maybe it's just that the good news in these times is getting reported more. In this pandemic, we now see ways that life is winning out over death. It's, it's as if people are finally realizing, or in spite of themselves realizing, we've got enough to fight in the world with COVID. So let's just draw together. Let's unite in the spirit. Let's respect our common humanity and forget our differences. I, for one, don't want to see this end. Let's not go back to, if it bleeds, it leads. Instead, let's sustain our newsreels even after we've gone through this crisis with good news. And when Jesus came bursting into that upper room, Somewhere in Jerusalem, on the evening of the first day of the week, he finds the disciples holed up behind locked doors, disoriented, sad, and very afraid. They had been to the tomb early in the morning, and finding it empty, they went away fearing for their own safety. The disciples had lost so much. Their friend, their teacher, their master, and they weren't even able to mourn him properly. Lacking faith and lacking hope, they dare not leave their hideaway, lest they too get taken away like Jesus' body had overnight. Their situation is remarkably similar to the one that many face today, sequestered away for fear of a virus, not able to visit sick loved ones in the hospital or to mourn those who have passed away. This crisis has brought uncertainty since no one knows what the future will bring what will it mean to reopen? Will life actually ever get back to normal? Do we even want it to go back to the way it was? Or have we learned things about ourselves and others during this time that we want to hold on to, that we don't want to lose? Has isolation taught us the kind of togetherness and unity of purpose that we need in our school, in our communities, and in our world. Wouldn't that be an ironic takeaway? The coronavirus pandemic has driven interest in uplifting headlines. It's driven it way, way up. And just last night, I don't know if you all tuned in, but the One World Together at Home live concert celebrated healthcare workers. And it also encourages us to stay home and stay together and ride this out. And that we have each other, no matter what happens. My first big takeaway from this 
is the when of Jesus appearing to the disciples for the first time after his resurrection. He comes to them in their moment of doubt and fear, in their time of isolation. God comes to us in the times when we have no idea of what is going to happen to us and when fear immobilizes us. God comes to the upper room. Jesus comes to the upper room to provide evidence of the life that he has given to us. In the now famous story of Jesus walking on the water and calming the storm at sea, remember what his first words to his disciples and Peter are. It is I, be not afraid. When Jesus comes to the disciples, huddled, intrepidly in that upper room, he stands amid them and projects calm. He says three times, peace be with you. And he gives them the spirit as a comfort to unite them and to keep them safe. I felt that same spirit in many of our services together and meetings together and in my classes. Not surprisingly, Jesus came and vis to visit his disciples knowing that they would feel defeated and understanding the support they would need in order to move forward. And Jesus comes to us now and he empowers us to go to those people who are feeling defeated and fearful and to understand the support they need. How often God comes to us in difficult times of our lives and empowers us to be resilient and to protect not just ourselves, but others as well. And now we get to that main character in the story, this guy Thomas, one of my favorite stories. He's late to the party, isn't he? Perhaps there's a little bit of a subtle reminder here for us just how important it is to trust the authorities, the scientists, the doctors, nurses, healthcare experts, our parents who look after us in a time like this, who are all telling us, continue to stay at home. All of these individuals want what's best for us. And why did Thomas miss Jesus' visit? Because he didn't stay at home. And when he does come back in, he refuses to trust the accounts of his friends, saying, we saw Jesus earlier this evening. He doesn't believe these partners of his, with whom he's been traveling for the last three years through the countryside, listening to the message of Jesus. So when he comes back after venturing out on his own and hears them tell the story of Jesus come back from the dead, visiting in the room, it is just too much for his rational mind. Too much for him to trust the account of his friends. So Thomas makes a choice. He chooses not to believe. He won't take that leap of faith without the visual evidence, without experiencing it for himself. Hence, he's been remembered and conjured throughout history as Doubting Thomas. And often in the vernacular, calling someone a Doubting Thomas signals that the person won't believe no matter how much evidence he or she is given. But I don't think Thomas should be vilified this morning. Frederick Beekner, the wonderful writer and apologist, said this, and I quote, a God who leaves no room for doubt leaves no room for me. Thomas and Beekner is just like all of us. Thomas is doubtful and says he will not believe until he can see 
and touch for himself. Or in other words, Thomas wants proof. He wants empirical verification. Well, what's wrong with that? Wouldn't you want proof? And in our scientific age, we have all been trained to verify through sensory experience, running experiments, and obtaining empirical evidence what is actually happening in a situation. Thomas stands as a pivotal fixture fixture, excuse me, in the story because while all the disciples before him did get to see and touch and hear Jesus directly, the millions of us who come after don't have that same opportunity. So you see, here we have a new phase of the story, a new stage of our community life together, a new way to think about faith. And it all begins with this story of Thomas, who famously doubted. He stands at that inflection point, that transition. Let's look at the way that Jesus responds to Thomas. Does he rebuke him for doubting? No. No, Jesus allows him to see and to touch and to put his finger in the wounds in his palms and his hand and in his side. He doesn't get angry with him for wanting empirical evidence. He understands. He gives Thomas what he needs for faith. Let's him touch and see in one of the most intimate moments in Scripture. And then Jesus goes on to say how much he understands all of us, all of us who will fo follow Thomas and hear the story, but maybe not put our fingers in his wounds. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet who have come to believe. We cannot see, we cannot verify, we cannot amass proof, and yet we are invited to the blessings of faith in Christ. To see something of his wounds and to understand the wondrous love that God has shown for us in his Son. And my last takeaway from all this is that then that means it's up to us to provide the proof. It's up to us to make the experiment of our lives, the empirical evidence that other people see that allow them to know that God's love and presence is among us. There was a song we used to sing in my high school youth group. I would guess that Many of you probably know it, and it's called, They'll Know We Are Christians by Our Love. We need to run that experiment every single day and make sure that we prove to the world by the empirical evidence of our lives that our God is one of love and kindness to come who comes to those who are. And as you run that experiment, here are the things that we're looking to prove. Forgiveness. It says right here, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. Hope is the second thing we're looking for in our experiment. We all need to acknowledge our own woundedness and brokenness, and yet to know that there is hope that is, why we, that is what we celebrate in the Easter season. That's what we're celebrating here today when we take communion together. The power of God to bring life out of death and hope out of despair. And the third thing when you're running your experiment is this, life. Jesus came 
so we can have life and have it more abundantly. In light of the resurrection, we know that life wins out over death. We need to see these expressions every day of forgiveness, hope, and life to believe. We need to see the power of love reaching out from one of us to another of us. We need to see these demonstrations of our humanity broadcast in our Zoom sessions, in our reporting of our days around the dinner table at night to our families, even as we run the experiment of our lives. Amen. We now continue by saying the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, True God from true God, begotten, not made of one being with the Father, through whom all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit in the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. And for our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. With the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the light of the world to come. Amen. We continue now with the prayers of the people. Time of silence after each bidding. Please feel free to offer in your own prayers or name silently or aloud in your family of people that are looking for and holding up or situations in the world that you would like to bathe in prayer. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world. For our Bishop Kevin, for this gathering. While ministers and people, let us pray for the church. I ask your prayers for peace and goodwill among the nations. I ask your prayers for the well-being of all people, especially those who've been afflicted by COVID-19. We think especially of New York City and other urban centers around the world. And we pray for justice and peace this morning. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. We remember especially our friends and neighbors 
at Andrew's Place, at Tiffany House, at the Sunday Breakfast Mission in Wilmington. We pray for those who are incarcerated at the James T. Vaughn Correctional Center in Smyrna. And we pray for those in any need or trouble this morning. I ask your prayers for all who, like Thomas, seek God or a deeper knowledge of God. Pray that they may find and be found by God. I ask your prayers for the departed, especially for Michael Evans and his family, and all those who have lost their lives, the thousands and thousands, since the outbreak of the coronavirus. Pray for those who have died. Now I ask your prayers for this community. I ask prayers for Phil Pentinger, for Amy Mather, for Toby Blizzard, for Mimi Whitney, Ms. Brownlee's friend who has cancer, for Enrico Filippelli, Nevio Leonardo, for Messiah and his grandma, and their family. We pray for Darlene, and for Norm, and for Fred. We pray for Peabody Hutton, class of 65, Bernadette's sister, Tammy Sample's sons, Lamar and DeAndre, for alum Fred Starr, class of 51, Roy Foster, class of 67. We continue to offer prayers of thanksgiving for those who have recovered, including Meg Chamberlain, class of 93. Gordon Juiced, class of 67. Many names you might like to add at this time. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored, especially St. Andrew and St. Anne and St. Thomas, whom we remember today. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own way on this day. Hasten, O God, the coming of your kingdom, and grant that we, your servants, who now live by faith, may with joy behold your Son and his coming. In glorious majesty, even Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. And now we get to share that same peace with each other that Jesus shared with those disciples in the upper room when he appeared to them. And so I say to you, the peace of the Lord be always with you. Please, in your families, greet and hug one another. We need that physical touch during this difficult time. Thank you for loving one another. I will offer the opening, the offertory sentences, um, and then we have an offertory anthem offered by the Sager family. I can't thank them enough. I'm excited about that. What a wonderful group of musical selections we have had today. And I'll just remind you, as you see in your program, that we're still trying to support as a vestry project, those domestic workers who have lost their jobs, cannot support their families, 
as a result of COVID-19. So if you'd like to give, the website is right there for you. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God. This joyful Easter tide, away with sin and sorrow. My love, the crucified, has sprung to life this morning. Had Christ that once was slain, never his three day prison. Our faith had been in vain, but now is Christ our reason, our reason, our reason, our reason. This flood hath lost its chill since Jesus crossed the river. Lord of all life from him, my passing life deliver. And Christ that once was slain, never ceased to be a prison. Our faith had been in vain, but now is Christ our reason, our reason. Thank you. We continue with the Sursum Corda. Please join me at home in making these responses. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to God. Worship and praise belong to you, author of all being. Your power sustains. Your love restores our broken world. You are unceasingly at work from chaos, bringing order and filling emptiness with life. Christ, raised from the dead, proclaims the dawn of hope. He lives in us that we may walk in light. Your spirit is fire in us. Your breath is power to purge our sin and warm our hearts to love. As children of your redeeming purpose, freed by him who honor from the tomb and who burst forth from the tomb and opened the gate of life. We offer you our praise with angels and with archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. <laughs> Praise and thanksgiving be to you, Lord of all, for by the cross eternal life is ours and death is swallowed up in victory. In the first light of Easter glory, broke from the tomb and changed the women's sorrow into joy. From the garden, the mystery dawned that he whom they had loved and lost is with us now in every place and forever. Making himself known in the breaking of the bread, speaking peace to the fearful disciples, welcoming weary fishermen on the shore, he renewed the promise of his presence and of new birth in the Spirit, who sets the seal of freedom on your sons and daughters. 
before he was given up to suffering and death, and recalling the night of Israel's release, the night in which slaves walked free. At supper with his disciples, he took bread and he offered you thanks. He broke the bread and he gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. And then after supper, he took the cup of wine. And again, giving thanks to you, he offered to his friends and said, drink this, all of you, this is my blood of the new covenant shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do so to remember me. We now obey your son's command. We recall his blessed passion and death, his glorious resurrection and ascension, and we look for the coming of his kingdom. Made one with him, we offer you these gifts, and with them ourselves, a single, holy, living sacrifice. Hear us, most merciful Father, and send your Holy Spirit upon us and upon this bread and this wine that, overshadowed by his life-giving power, they may be the body and blood of your Son, that we may be kindled with the fire of your love and renewed for the service of your kingdom. Help us who are baptized into the fellowship of Christ's body to live and work to your praise and glory. May we grow together in unity and love until at last in your new creation, we enter into our heritage in the company of the Virgin Mary, the apostles and prophets, and of all our brothers and sisters, living and departed. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory be yours, world without end. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, just join your hands at home and say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And may us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For now is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia! Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The blood of Christ, the cup of our salvation. And for all of those who don't take as a practice but would like a blessing, I ask a blessing this morning on your families, on your friends, and on you, that you may be people who believe that life conquers over death and who bring forgiveness and hope and love to all those 
as we do come into contact in Christ's name. Amen. Please join me now in the post-communion prayer. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, we have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ. And you have now led us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness. Jesus Are you in Christ, it? our Lord. No. Amen. Nuts. No, no. And now, may the peace of God, which surpasses all of our understanding and which came to those disciples in the upper room today. Be in our hearts and guard us from fear. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you this beautiful morning and all the days of your lives. Our closing hymn is offered to us by James Turner. Please sing along. Thank you, Hutch. Thank you.